I'm Kareem Ray, your host at the One Soccer Nation podcast. And today I have the pleasure of interviewing Richard Elbert. Richard is head of the capital investment sector for the UK government in North America. Now, our viewers are probably wondering why I'm having Richard on. Guys, don't worry, I always connect it back to soccer, but in this case, we're talking about UK football. So let's dive in. Richard, thank you so much for taking the time. How's it going? Fabulous. Absolutely a pleasure to be on, Kareem. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. So, you know, just a little bit of context for our viewers. We met at Soccer X down in Miami. Um, it was pouring raining the last day of the <laughs> event. <laughs> and um, and uh, I seen Richard and, you know, I just sparked off a conversation. You were actually waiting for your Uber. Indeed. That was, uh, so it was, it was a pretty productive wait because um, it the, the rain was coming down in buckets at that stage. Yeah, and you know, I sparked off a conversation with you, and I'm I'm so happy we connected. Um, got a little a little picture in, and then now we're connecting on the podcast, and I have a few questions to ask you. Just to dive in, you have an impressive background with over 30 years of experience in the private sector with major blue chips, including American Express and Chevron. Now serving in the public se sector with the UK government, can you share how and why you started working with the UK government? Well, first of all, that's very kind of you to say. Um, and I've, I've been really fortunate in my career to have had the opportunity to live and work and do deals all over the world. Um, my accent notwithstanding, I am a very proud British national. Um, I was born and raised in Boston, but spent the majority of my adult life living and working in London um, and was sort of always interested in government and in politics. And I just felt that sort of at this stage of life and career, it was a good opportunity for me to do some public service. So let's say it was a higher calling. Got it. Just, you know, I'm interested to even know, and even just for viewers, how can someone, this is an off topic question, um, but how can someone, um, you know, follow the steps in regards to get where you are today? You know, what do they need to do in order to get where you are today? Oh, well, I mean, I, I think, you know, fall, fall, letting your kind of passion be your guide, right? Because I think as human beings, we always tend to excel in areas that we have keen interest in. And, um, you know, so typical path for me, wound up getting my MBA and then um, and, and wound up getting hired in, in, into Chevron after graduating and um you know I was initially hired um with the view for me to be eventually relocated to Spain because in at the time Spain was kind of the last market in kind of the developed world that had not yet liberalized its um its oil and gas sector um but this was ancient history so back in 1989 and then the Berlin Wall fell, and I always had a very keen interest in um, the history and politics and culture of Central and Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. And basically, after a year after I had started working in New York, um, they relo relocated me to Bratislava in what was at the time Czechoslovakia. So moved with all of my worldly possessions in two suitcases. Um, over to Slovakia to be the company's man on the ground. And uh, that was an absolute life-changing experience. And little did I know that it would be about 30 years later that I would eventually come back to the U.S. Nice. And you're you're based out in Boston. How How's Boston? How's Boston been treating you? I love, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, I kind of, you know, a Bostonian in my in my core, um, but this city has absolutely transformed in the you know 25, 30 years that I that I've been away. Um, you know, it is absolutely a, a a premier global city now. It's with all of that growth and diversification that's been driven by the the the, the knowledge economy that that we have here. Right? So we've always had the world's best universities, but we didn't have 
the employment opportunities to keep the talent here. And, you know, with the, the growth of new industries, you know, in particularly biotech and deep tech and so on, it's created this incredibly vibrant ecosystem, which includes not just academia and research, but also, of course, you know, commerce and investment. And that virtuous circle has has really transformed the city in turn in it. So it's it's you know, and the, the consulate where, where I'm based is is in Kendall Square, which is kind of um colloquially known as the smartest square mile in the world. And it's a it's a great place to be around, you know, incredibly intelligent intelligent, talented, driven people. So it's it's great to be back. And obviously from a sports perspective, yeah, I might be somewhat biased, but I I, I do think Boston is one of the be best, if not the best sports city in the world. So just in terms of my interest in sport, it's been fabulous to be back. Nice. I've never been to Boston. Um, well, there's an open invitation, Kareem, that's for sure. Sounds good. Um, yeah. Given your extensive global experience, how do you think your international perspective contributes to your role in the UK government, particularly in the area of strategic investment in sports? Well, like, you know, as I've been been saying, you know, I've had kind of a sort of bipolar existence, for lack of a better term, sort of I equally straddle both sides of the Atlantic and, you know, not just my career or my present job, but my family, my friends, and my interests. And, you know, as mentioned, you know, I, I have a lifelong passion for sport. I have as much interest in soccer, cricket, and rugby that I do in American football, hockey, and baseball. I'm as passionate a supporter of the Boston Bruins as I am of Chelsea. And I so I guess it's kind of like the, the combination of that interest and my knowledge of the global sporting landscape and all of my experience in the investment world, I think that this kind of a unique combination, which serves me well, I guess. I, growing up, did you play any sports or, you know, was there a sport that you really focused on? Yeah, I mean, I wanted playing sort of baseball for a, a long time, you know, 30 years or so. Um, like every Bostonian of my generation, we all played hockey kind of growing up as, as part of the Bobby Orr generation. Um, I was on my high school soccer team, but um, again, this was back in the 70s. So, you know, if you saw how we played, that would be nothing to be proud of. It was it was basically hockey players looking to keep fit during the off season. Um, but just strangely enough, I mean, I've always been interested in soccer since I was a, you know, a little kid. I think the first game I ever saw on television was the 1970 World Cup final between Brazil and Italy. So, you know, talk about a great introduction to the sport. And, you know, when I was, my friends and I were old enough to be able to ride the subway by ourselves, we started going to see the New England team men who were the Boston-based team in the, in the old North American soccer league. So, you know, got to see professional soccer for the first time and got to see the Cosmos when they came with, with Naskins and Cruyff and Canalia and Beckenbauer. And then when I moved to Europe, it was kind of like a dream come true because I got to see world-class football on a regular basis. Um, when I, I lived in Belgium for a year and a half and um, became a fan of Anderlecht. And then of course, when I moved to London, um, I always lived within walking distance of Stamford Bridge. I think I arrived on Saturday, the 30th of January. And I think the next day went to a match at the bridge and still a, still a club member today, long time season ticket holder. And, you know, again, still bleeding true blue. Nice. You're not bleeding red, blue, bleeding blue. Bleeding blue. Absolutely. How is the UK government actively promoting and encouraging sports investments as part of its economic strategy? Well, maybe I'll talk a little bit about, you know, what my role encompasses. So, you know, as you mentioned in the introduction, um, head of capital investment for North America. So which means uh, my team and I work with the world's leading private investors. So private equity firms, venture capital firms, real estate trusts, um, public sector pension funds, university endowments, and, and so on to support 
the deployment of capital into um, sectors of the UK economy and society that are of utmost strategic importance and that are in line with, with government priorities. So that includes a number of things like life sciences and technology and energy, infrastructure, uh, real estate, and so on, but, but also sport. I mean, sport is one of the most um, prominent, successful, and valuable sectors in the UK. <laughs> Um, it generates roughly $50 billion in economic value for the country. Um, the English Premier League is the most watched sports league in the world, full stop. Any sport, any league, any country, anywhere. Um, and so it's you know important for us to support the deployment of strategic capital to um, enhance the continued prosperity of, of, of that sector. I mean, we kind of do it in, in, in a couple of ways. So just through the ordinary course of business, again, across all of those multiple verticals, we're engaging with the world's leading investors on a daily basis. And so we're talking to them about investments in multiple asset classes, including sport, which is now really you know, emerging um, as one of the fastest growing investment verticals in, in, in the world. Um, government also has a, a, has a really strong kind of convening power. We're very good at bringing people together. So that could be you know, kind of bespoke introductions. So um, introducing prospective owners with existing asset owners. Um, or we could do things at more at scale and, and putting on events. So for example, we we hosted a big event at Wembley Stadium this past July where we had over a hundred of the world's most prominent sports investors and we had the leaders of pretty much all the national governing bodies and and leagues across UK sport, both men's and women. So just kind of getting them in the same room to start the conversation, you know, kind of gets, gets the ball rolling. Well, wow, no, that's so amazing. And, you know, we I mentioned this before when we spoke, you're in such a, a unique and very powerful position um, in regards to facilitating these transactions. Are you guys only working with accredited investors? Well, yeah. So first, so you know, I mean, we're not actually kind of brokering or managing transactions. You know, we're not in an investment bank or advisors. You know, we're the government, right? So we're not doing due diligence. We're not providing reps and warranties to investors. You know, it, it's it's mainly about promoting the opportunity at a strategic level, educating investors about the dynamics of the sector to inform their investment strategies and their ultimate investment decision making and you know kind of making a call to basically sort of screen investors who we feel would be a good fit for existing asset owners within the UK sports ecosystem so i mean there is an element of you know of, of screening you know it's um it encompasses a number of things beyond, you know, kind of accreditation. You know, we want to ensure that we're attracting, um, you know, high quality owners who are committed for the long term and whose investment strategy and, and drivers are, are, you know, in line with what we're trying to attract. Um, ultimately, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about it later on, but I mean, ultimately it's it's the leagues themselves that will determine whether or not um, an owner is sufficiently fit um, to, to, to make that acquisition. Um, but as government, of course, you know, we can't be seen to be promoting investors who, you know, really are not the types that we, that we seek to attract, if that makes sense. Understood. In regards to net worth, what's what's the minimum net worth that the individual has to meet? Well, so when so one thing is we're not we're not working with um individuals. So we're not working with ultra, oh, yeah. ultra right. individual because of the potential reputational risk. 
Now, there are a lot of dynamics at play within you know, current trends of, 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 the, of the ascending flow of, of private capital investment into UK sport and particularly into football. It's becoming much more institutionalized, right? So whereas in the past, you know, it typically was, you know, the local benefactor, you know, somebody in the local community who owned the biggest business in the town um, and was a lifelong supporter of the club and wanted to give back and they were kind of doing it for either altruistic reasons or, you know, whatever the case may be, then it started to attract ultra high net worth individuals on a global basis. And without getting into that, we've seen what some of the potential risks of that are, right? There have been a number of experiences that were not particularly positive. Um, and that's what we're trying to, to kind of get away from. And in working with, you know, world-class institutional investors, it's not just the influx of capital that they bring to kind of support cash flow. It's as much about kind of the depth of their management expertise and the strength of their global networks that will help these clubs unlock greater value and, and therefore, you know, help um, get to a, a better state of long-term financial sustainability. Why would these U.S. you know U.S.-based uh, venture capital funds or um, pension funds want to allocate their capital to overseas to UK sports? Well, I mean, so great question. I mean, most of these world-class investors have global investment mandates anyway, right? so they're investing around the world in science, technology, real estate energy infrastructure and so on. Um, as I mentioned earlier, sports is one of the, you know, fastest growing emerging asset classes. And so, so particularly like for, for US investors, I and mean, I think it's the, it's the scale of the opportunity, right? So if you were to look at the top 50 most valuable sports assets in the world, and I think, you know, Forbes and 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 other sources going to publish that on a, on a, on an annual basis. Out of that top fifty, um, pretty much the entire NFL is in there, um, as well as a, a handful of, of of other teams in the NBA and, and Major League Baseball. There's only eight soccer teams globally in the top fifty in terms of um, asset value. But if you were to flip it and look at the the, the fifty most popular sports brands in the world in terms of number of followers. It's pretty much the exact opposite. I think there are like 10 North American teams in the top 50 and the rest are all soccer teams. So that's what, it, that's what you know, interests US investors, right? Is it's less expensive to buy in and the commercial upside is greater, right? So like what I like to say is, you know, again, we go back to say, for example, to the Premier League, um, it's played out on a, on a stage in the UK, but the audience is global. So you're talking, you know, hundreds of millions of consumers around the world as, as potential sources of revenue generation and, and diversification. I think the other thing also is there's a, there's a scarcity of investment opportunities in North America, right? It's very, very rare that one of the teams in the four major um, leagues in North America comes up for sale. And when they do, you know, the price tags are enormous. And for the leagues that are expanding, the expansion fees also are quite significant. They're now, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to buy in, even into Major League Soccer, right? So it's kind of, they're playing on that delta between kind of lower entry cost and higher potential upside. Got it. Yeah. And when you when you mentioned the commercial aspect of Europe, that really sparked in my head in regards to why it's so attractive, especially with promotion relegation down in Europe. We don't have that in US or Canada. So, you know, shops are closed up over there. Um, Right, and, and, and that actually is, I think, one of the areas that we focus on 
when we engage with U.S. investors, right, is that education piece because the structure and the dynamics of, of sport in North America is so incredibly different to what it is in the rest of the world and in the U.K. specifically, as you mentioned. It, it's a, it's a franchise-based model. So basically, these investors pay a shed load of money for their entry ticket into a very lucrative club. And once you're in, you're in, right? And, you know, so, and then with that comes certain rights and privileges. And in many cases, it includes geographic exclusivity. I mean, compare, say, in the NHL, you know, Toronto, one team, right, could probably support dozens more in terms of economic potential, compare that to London, where there's something like, you know, 15 professional clubs within the M25 ring road and, and dozens more if you if you look at the surrounding uh, suburban counties, right? So having that geographic exclusivity is, is critical for value generation. Um, you know, the same thing on, on the facilities, right? So if you have less teams in the city, you own one of the premier entertainment venues in the city. So the ability to be able to utilize it 365 days a year is a lot easier than say in, in a market like London where not only will you have say those 15 professional football clubs, but you also have a couple of rugby teams and a couple of cricket teams and you've got Wembley and you've got Twickenham and you've got all the arenas. And so there's a lot more competition um, for utilizing those venues. Um, you don't, in, in North American sport, you don't have a super national body which governs the sport, right? So nobody needs to tell the NFL owners what to do, right? There's no FIFA, there's no UEFA. They want to change the rules, they change the rules. They, you know, they can do pretty much whatever they want. Um, so that that's a big difference. The portability of clubs, you know, uh, people are amazed in England when they hear that you could have a, you know, the Cleveland Rams become the Los Angeles Rams, become the St. Louis Rams, and then the Los Angeles Rams again. That could never happen in England, right? And so that, and U.S. owners hear that, and then investors hear that, like, hmm, really? So I, I can't just relocate my team? No. Um, you know, collective bargaining with, with, with unions, salary caps, get huge differences. Um, Promotion and relegation, you mentioned, right, which creates a much heightened risk factor for investing outside of North America, because, you know, in, it's a closed shop in North America, and once you're in, you're in. In fact, there's an inverse um, incentive, because if you finish last, like hopefully the New England Patriots will this year, you get the top draft pick next year, right? Um, you have a, a much greater degree of revenue share within the North American leagues, right? So like a lot of times you hear people talk about the NFL being um, socialism for billionaires, right? Because they're basically sharing the wealth. Um, European football, England particularly, it is as is, is, um, uh, orthodox capitalism as you can get, right? Because the only reason uh, for you to be in the league is based upon merit on the pitch, right? You're not good enough. You're not in the league, and that's and that's the way and that's the way it is. So educating North American investors on that difference. So yes, they're looking for to take advantage of that that delta between lower entry cost and higher revenue upside, but the risk profile is obviously very very different. Wow, that Europe is such a different beast. Um, it, you know, in regard, I'm interested, this just came to mind. I'm interested to get your thoughts on it in regards to U.S. investment, you know, thinking about, you know, the way MLS is structured. Um, investor capital is really safe because shop is closed. Yes. Um, do you see that hindering the growth of soccer in the U.S.? You know, I... I think the, I mean, obviously what MLS, you know, constantly, um, for lack of a better word, struggles with or, or straddles is probably a better way is like 
wanting to be part of the world game and having all the best aspects of that, you know, in terms of global player pool, global fan base, um, you know, being able to participate in international competitions, the whole supporter culture is all very, very different than the traditional North American sports. And in fact, that is what I believe is attracting the current generation of, 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 of soccer fans in North America, right? So if you look at the demographic profile of, um, of soccer fans, I think in general in North America and MLS in particular, it skews significantly younger than then, I mean, the NFL is all is all pervasive, but I mean, if you want to compare it to MLB, you know, it's 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 you know, it's it's a two generations difference, right? I think the average Major League Baseball fan is over fifty. The average MLS fan is you know squarely between eighteen and thirty five, right? And they and and with the way the sport is covered now so pervasively. In here in North America, I mean, I think it's the same in Canada, but you know, certainly in in the U.S., I can watch any any game, any league from anywhere at any time, which is absolutely incredible. So the fans here understand what the world game is all about. Now, I I, I mentioned in my in one of my the earlier answers about the old North American Soccer League, and and that was a failed experiment. Um, and and for a number of reasons, you know, I think they they spent too much too soon, they expanded too too quickly, and so when MLS was was created, they wanted to make sure that they were a lot more prudent in the way they managed the league, and so having that that franchise based model and the structure, I I agree, I think it it, it allows the roots to take hold. In the local communities, right? But I think at some stage, and 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 you know, it it may come sooner rather than later. There'll be sufficient pressure from the core fan base to say we want to be just like the rest of the world, and and especially since if you look at the 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 leagues below MLS, you know, U USL in in the US. I mean, they're they're expanding, they're growing. Um, the quality on the pitch is improved. The quality of the infrastructure is improved. They've just signed a breakthrough television contract with CBS Sports. So, you know, maybe the state of readiness for to open it up to lower divisions wasn't there. No, it definitely wasn't there. 35 years ago, there was there was pretty much nothing at grassroots in the US. But at, at some stage, I think within the, within the next several years that that, that will change. Yeah, uh, just quick thought came to mind too. I was watching the I'm not too sure if you watched it too, the David Beckham documentary. I have not, but I've had lots of people tell me about it. And of yeah. course I was there that you know, I've well, I've seen his whole career. So Yeah, I, I think you'd love it. Um, you know, watching the MLS when David in that documentary when David Beckham went to the MLS would look terrible. You know, um, this is a few years back. They were playing on NFL uh, fields and you know, football fields and stuff like that. To see where MLS has grown now is just night and day. Um, so cool to see it grow. And, and, you know, the point that you mentioned with the core fans pressuring the league for that change, that, that could definitely be a big push um, in the future. With saying that, I want to, you know, dive back into the UK government. Um, you guys are taking steps to reg um, regulate professional football and support its financial sustainability. How does the government balance its role in regulating football with the goal of attracting major investors and ensuring the financial viability of sports organizations? Well, that is a great question. And, and in fact, it's it's absolutely a fundamental question, right? So, um, I mean, I personally believe that um, having football being in a state of solid long-term financial sustainability benefits all stakeholders, including the owners and the players and the non-playing staff and the local economies and most of all the fans. And in fact, it, the recommendation for the establishment of a football regulator actually came out of a fan-led review 
um, that was commissioned by the UK government a couple of years ago, coming out of COVID and coming out of the the whole furor over the um, you know potential establishment of the European Super League, right? Um, because, like, so for example, there there are hundred there are hundred and fourteen professional uh, soccer teams in in England since the establishment of the Premier League in 1992-93, 40 of those clubs have gone into financial administration and a couple have actually gone into liquidation. And when that happens, it's devastating, right? You know, everybody loses, you know, it, you know, not only, um, you know, do the fans lose out, but, you know, from the club that they supported all their lives, you, you're talking about ripping all of that shared cultural legacy out of a community it is the loss of jobs, is the loss of um, development pathways for, for local players. Um, there's the economic impact to the bars and the restaurants around the stadium and so on. So we want to avoid that happening, right? Um, so on, on the other side, you know, having said all of that, um, English football is 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 from a certainly from a revenue generation perspective is the strongest of any league in the, any country in the world. Right? Premier League number one by far. Even the Championship, so the the second tier down, I think is either the number six or seven um, uh, most lucrative league in the world in terms of revenue generation. So more than MLS more than the top leagues in Holland and Belgium and Portugal and Switzerland, et cetera, et cetera, right? And part of the reason for that, of course, is that we have such an attractive product on the pitch. And we have an attractive product on the pitch because we have investors who have funded it, right? So we want to ensure that any regulation doesn't serve as an impediment to attracting the world's best players and obviously attracting world-class investors. In fact, again, I think it should do the opposite. It should support um, that. Absolutely. Okay, so with the government regulating football in the UK, could you clarify the extent of the regulatory's coverage? Will it regulate all soccer leagues in the UK? Well, so firstly, I, I just need to clarify that it won't be government that is directly regulating. Um, it'll be the it'll be an independent regulator, albeit one that has been that is being established uh, by Parliament. So there is a, a bill um, that is going to be put forward within the current Parliament called the, the Football uh, Governance Bill, and that that will establish the regulator. Now, in terms of the regulators coverage. So uh, firstly, it's England only. Um, so not the leagues in Scotland, Wales, or Northern Ireland. And it's professional football only. So um, just the professional league. So the, the, the five leagues, so the Premier League, Championship, League One, League Two, and the National League. Um, you know, in terms of, it, of its scope, I think the, the, the primary element of it is that there will be a licensing regime. So all 114 clubs in England will need to get a license to operate and, and have that renewed on an annual basis. And it'll be um, determined by the independent regulator whether that club is financially viable. And there'll be a number of measures of which they'll look at. Um, there'll be a requirement to have fan representation in the governance of the clubs um because it's meant as i mentioned kind of the, in, the initial inspiration was to kind of prevent clubs from breaking away and joining a super league it will also um curb their ability to move stadiums um change their club colors or their crests so all things that are important to the heritage of the club and, and particularly from the fans perspective um there will be um, an enhanced owners and directors test. So similar to what I was talking about earlier in terms of screening investors, I mean, ultimately it will be the Premier League and the EFL and the National League will, will determine whether or not a um, an owner or director is 
fit and proper, but it will be under the criteria that's established by the independent regulator. And the independent regulator also will have the opportunity to intervene and, and, and effectively arbitrate a revenue share arrangement between the Premier League and, and the EFL. Um, so borrowing a little bit from the North American model to ensure that all of that wealth that is being generated at the top tiers of football effectively filters its its way down uh, down through the pyramid. Got it. So Richard, um, how is the government approaching investments in women's football? Um, very enthusiastically, <laughs> I would say. Um, women's football in England has the potential to be a billion dollar industry. Um, and that was highlighted by a recent sort of comprehensive review of women's football that was led by uh, the former England international, Karen Carney. Um, and it, like I said, it was a very comprehensive review that touched upon all aspects of the women's game. But from a capital investment perspective, it, it specifically called out the kind of dire acute need for, for greater investment in um, infrastructure and facilities that are better suited for women's football, and, and particularly as um, it becomes increasingly more professional. Um, also, we've established something called the um, Women's Sport Investment Accelerator. Um, it's, it's a joint initiative with uh, one of the big four consulting firms. Um, so there was an application process that any rights holders um, across women's sport in the UK could apply to be part of the accelerator. And roughly 20 or so um, were, were accepted. And, and as part of the accelerator, they're getting ongoing mentorship from uh, leading individuals in women's sport, obviously making use of the um, consulting expertise of, of our partners Deloitte. Um, and we're also facilitating connections for potential investors. Um, so, you know, that's, I think, really the the first thing, I think, in, in what will ultimately be a number of, of initiatives that are that are focused on the growth of, uh, of women's football. Yeah, I like the sound of that $1 billion, a billion dollars. Um, you know, women's football is just and women's soccer as well down in North America is just taking off. Why is the time now to grow women's football? Why is, why is the time right now? Why are investors getting behind it now? Um, you know, investors, I think, definitely have seen, you know, obviously the incredible growth in television viewing numbers, in, um, in attendance numbers, so not, I mean, it was, you know, it was obviously, you know, the Women's World Cup was obviously appointment viewing. But now that we're seeing that in women's club football, you know, both domestically and internationally, um, and, and and the nature of the investment is very different. And, and I've seen a number of studies, for example, even from a marketing perspective, that um, the, 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 the fan base for women's football and their affiliations tends to be a lot stickier to brands that associate themselves with women's football than you see on the men's side. Um, so I think, you know, investors are always, of course, looking for opportunities. And, and similar to what I mentioned earlier, um, the, the, the entry costs are still pretty low, relatively speaking. So um, more akin, I would say, to a venture capital type of investment than in a large cap investment that you would see, for example, the major pri private equity firms undertake. I mean, you can still make a fairly substantial investment in women's football for 10 million pounds, you know? Um, and then with all of that growth trajectory to come, and many opportunities to extract more and more value and to kind of, you know, and bank on the appreciation of that. I think, you know, one of the challenges, particularly, which is more so, I think, the case in England, is that is on the governance side because the vast majority of the clubs fall with under the umbrella of the men's team. 
Um, and, and so there's going to have to be some kind of eventual movement, I think, to um, detach in some ways the, the women's team, especially in terms of how they can generate value. So enabling them to go out and, and sign their own shirt sponsors, right? Um, and, and, and have more control how, over how they generate revenue and then potentially eventually to spin off. And, and, and I think that there will be investors that are interested in that. I mean, I know that, and I've spoken to a number of investors who, you know, are, who definitely kind of buy into that investment thesis. And from the American ones, you know, especially if they look at the NWSL here, um, the, the check sizes to get into that league have grown exponentially. Um, and if and especially if you look and see the the types of ownership groups in the NWSL, I mean they're now basically consortia of celebrity owners, right? And 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 some and some uh, institutional investors as well. Um, and so because there there isn't the same opportunity to buy into the U.S., you know the 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 women's soccer league in. In, in in England is you know again you know arguably the best in the world and attracting some you know some of the best talent in the world and so investors I think now are starting to to turn to that. Got it. Yeah. No, that's so true. Celebrities and the institutions, so true. Diving into um, multi sports and multi club ownership, how is the growing trend towards multi sports and multi club ownership impacting oh. the dynamics of sports management and governance? Yeah, another another great question. I mean, I mean I'll, I'll take the multi-sport one first. I think for, from a governance perspective, really, really no issue. From from a management perspective, I mean, I certainly these investors see the potential for commercial and operational synergies across their different sports properties. Um, I think from the fans' perspective, um, you know, especially living here in Boston, you know. I constantly hear Red Sox fans dialing up sports talk radio and complaining and saying, oh, every dollar that FSG invests in Liverpool is one less dollar that they can invest in the Red Sox. I mean, I, I think that's that's more fans' emotive perception rather than than the reality. Um on the and, and actually, you know, if you look at the um the kind of wave of new investors into English football and 50% of the teams in the Premier League now have some degree of American ownership. Most of them, if not all of them, are owners of multi-sports portfolios. So they have a team in the NFL or the NHL or, or Major League Baseball or the NBA and are starting to diversify. On the multi-club ownership, um, it, it's 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 a little bit different. Right? So from, from a... From a management perspective, at least on the on the footballing side, I think the the premise is that, or kind of the focus is on the development of playing talent, right? So if you have a portfolio of clubs, which includes investments in teams in lower divisions or in less prominent leagues, it's much better to have your players getting regular playing time um, in a competitive league. Than it is sitting on the bench or, or or up in the stands, you know. And the view is that hopefully they see, you know, the accelerated development of that playing talent, and eventually they come back to, for lack of a better word, the, the parent club. Uh, I think you know the Red Bull Group I, I probably I think had the most kind of clear a uh, distinction kind of within the hierarchy of their clubs. You have kind of New York and then Salzburg and then. Leipzig and 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 you see players kind of moving up the value chain. I think it's worked fairly fairly well for them. I haven't seen much evidence of it in 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 other uh, multi ownership groups. And by the way, there are now two hundred and fifty clubs in world football that are part of a multi club ownership group. And Awesome. Where it's run into problems is on the governance side, right? So again, on the on the playing side, um, from a financial perspective, I think also kind of the investment thesis is well. I mean, the fact is that players are assets, right? And they're incredibly valuable assets. And the more you can develop them, the greater the value is. So even if you don't 
bring them back to the parent club, you're selling them on for, for a big profit. And I think there's a strong element of that sort of value generation thesis that these multi-club owners are, are looking for. On the governance side, um, it's going to become more and more challenging the more of the, these teams are because they're going to wind up potentially playing each other in European competitions, right? So we've seen that recently with the likes of, for example, you know, Tony Bloom, who had an ownership stake in um, in Union saint gilois in, in Belgium, and they were drawn against Brighton um, in a European qualifier. Um, and that's going to happen more and more. And, and if you think about the growth of Club World Cup, that even globalizes the issue, right? So you can you can foresee, you can reasonably foresee a scenario where Manchester City, New York City, and Melbourne City are all in the Club World Cup, potentially playing against each other. So that 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 brings up a whole host of issues regarding the integrity of the competition, and and, and so it it is something that the likes of FIFA and UEFA are going and the and the other regional football governing bodies are going to have to address i think yeah that, that that's that's an interesting challenge right there there could be some manipulation in the future in regards to you know what team to what, what team do you want to win and push forward and stuff yeah totally or even if there's a suspicion of it that is even enough because the whole thing about sport versus any pretty much any other element of the entertainment industry is you don't know the outcome or you're not supposed to know the outcome. Right. And yeah. Yeah, so even if people think, you know, mm, you know, so Man City's playing New York City. Okay, okay. Maybe that's a bad example because we know who would win that. <laughs> but if New York City were playing Melbourne City, you know, how does the city football group deal with that in terms of making personnel decisions for, for example. Right. So yeah, it, it's, it's a growing area, and you know, as so often the case in sport, um, the authorities will kind of keep their heads in the sand until they can no longer do so, and something needs to be done about it. Hundred percent. How long do investors typically stay engaged in these sports investments, and when do they generally see an ROI? Um, well, I mean, in terms of how long, I, mean, I think the days of multi-generational family ownership of clubs, you know, the likes of the, um, the Hill Woods at Arsenal. And I think those days, sadly, are over. Um, you know, if you look at the private equity investment model, you know, across all asset classes, um, they typically have what's called a holding period of generally in the kind of the five year range, and then they sell it on. Um, and you know, and and really, and it's only when they sell it is when they see that that return, right? Because the sad thing is that the vast majority of football clubs do not make a profit from operations, right? So it requires the owners to um, inject capital every year um, to keep the club solvent. But when they sell it is when they get that return. So if you if you to look at out of I, I mentioned earlier the sort of top 50 most viable sporting assets in the world. If you to look at the I think they're whatever the seven or eight um soccer clubs that are in that list they had an average asset appreciation of 114% in the past 5 years. Meaning, so within that five-year holding period, the value of your investment has more than doubled, despite the fact that you're losing money from operations, right? So that is where the return is. Now, is it a good thing for football if there's a churn of ownership every five years? Probably not. Um, but there, but there are, you know, but also within the private equity world, there is, you know, something called an evergreen asset. And, and, and I'm hoping that, these institutional investors, you know, are also in it for the long term. Um, and it's not just going to be a kind of a, a recycling of ownership, you know, every, every few years. So what is the minimum investment amount required for individuals or entities looking to invest in UK sports? 
Additionally, could you shed light on the relationship with U.S. investors and why they choose to invest their capital in the U.K. sports landscape? Well, so firstly, I th there is no minimum investment threshold per se. You know, so uh, um, you know we're focused on um, you know spending our time and, and and energy and efforts on where we can make the biggest impact, right? So which brings the biggest value to to UK sport. Um, and that's not just determined by check size. You know, as I mentioned, it, you you can get you can make a a a substantial investment in women's sport for for ten million dollars, right? So it, it's it's more of a an art than a science about where 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 we focus. But I think again, I think it's kind of the 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 the, the underlying principle is where do we need where can we make the biggest impact where is the where is there the biggest need and that's kind of where we're, where we're focusing um on on the US investors I mean you know we talked a, you know a little bit about kind of why they look at at, at the UK and, and and I think obviously there's the familiarity of it as well I mean you know say the coverage of the Premier League um in the US is phenomenal I mean I mean NBC just do a just a tremendous job and it's really been a a real facilitator to the growth of the sport as a whole um in in the US and and the Premier League is the is the number one viewed um football league in the US you know more than our domestic league and more than any of the other European leagues or Mexico or or the South American leagues and you know and, and also you know it's easy to for these owners to hop on a plane and fly to London and for the institutional investors, a lot of them have um, offices and, and substantial presence in the UK anyway. So I think that that familiarity factor is very strong. And, and I think it's 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 part of the reasons why um, the UK just in general is, is an attractive capital investment uh, uh, um, environment for, for US investors. Got it. it. It was so cool to learn more about about what you do because it was you know I was I was hoping to hear that uh, when we when we met that you also facilitate capital back to the U.S. but you only take it from North America to the U.K. So uh, I was hoping to hear that one when we when we connected. But um you know I, I appreciate you taking the time um to share what you do, what the U.K. government is all about, and what they're doing in regards to sports. Um. You also lead the team in Boston, plus you have colleagues in the UK. How many people oversee this uh, various initiative? And, you know, if you could also provide me with some advice in regards to leadership and how to uh, lead a team successfully. So, I, well, so the short answer is um, quite a lot, but not enough. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, so from uh, from our, our general capital investment remit, um, I've got a fairly small small team in in North America. A couple of a couple of my team members are with me in Boston. I've got a few in New York, uh, one in Toronto, and and one in San Francisco. But of course, again, we're walk, working across the entire spectrum of 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 key verticals, not just sport. Um, we work very very closely, you know, on a continuous basis with our with our colleagues um, in the Department for Business and Trade in the UK. Um, more broadly speaking, we also have a team here in North America that's focused on sports economy. So more, more regarding trade and FDI, actually in both directions. So not from a capital investment perspective, but from a kind of commercialization uh, perspective. And, and I have a colleague of mine who leads that team who's, who's based in, in Los Angeles, and she also has team members dotted around North America. And kind of even more broadly, um, from the UK government perspective, we have the Department for Culture, Media, and Sport that oversees sport in its entirety in the UK um, from grassroots on up and across the board. Um, you know, so their mandate is is very broad, and it's as much about participation and the health and wellness of of of, of UK society um, as it is about the financial long term financial sustainability of UK sport. 
Um, having said that, um, they stepped in during the pandemic when you know the 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 the, the two main revenue drivers of kind of ticket revenue and broadcast revenue were switched off in their entirety overnight. And as you can imagine, um, you know, particularly for uh, football clubs in the lower tiers of the pyramid, and especially in other sports like rugby and cricket, to name a couple, they were in fairly difficult financial state and um, government had to step in with with assistance to keep them afloat. And I think what that did was kind of unmask kind of the the symptoms. And that is that, you know, there 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 are a lot of dysfunctional elements to the core economic model of sport. And and therefore I think that kind of set the tone for for government intervention. And so with regard to capital investment into professional sport, I'm I'm working um, as well with with colleagues within the Department for for Culture and Media and Sport, and we've we've collaborated on some initiatives, like for example the symposium that we had in, in at Wembley back during the summer. Um, the, the advice uh, on leadership. Um, Wait, before yeah. you answer that, before you ask, <laughs> what, what's the most amount of people that you've uh, you know led or managed? Um, I think kind of sort of direct um, or um, team roughly 50 plus. Um, and then those, and, those 50 like oversaw more people, right? Yeah, so uh, yeah, and also like, um, and also global, right? So, um, you know, coming from the, the product and working for major multinationals, you know, um, it's just part of the sort of standard model, organizational model that you have um, people leading global teams from one location. So not every all of your team are co-located with you. They're also remote. So that predates the pandemic, right? We, and so, um, you know, I've had decades of experience leading kind of diverse multinational teams. And I, and I think that um, requires a different a different leadership style, right? So, um, always needing to kind of strike that balance between, you know, giving your team the space and the autonomy and the accountability to be able to um, do what they need to do and develop their careers. And, you know, for you to be there to obviously to support that with guidance and direction and strategy and air cover and, you know, being pulled out from time to time to shake the right hands and kiss the right babies and, and whatever they need to do to kind of deliver on, 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 on what they, on what they need. Um, and I think also, you know, when you, when you're dealing with um, geographically dispersed teams, you, you, by right, you, you need to be a lot more, kind of effective, focused, and economical in the way that you interact with them, right? Because you don't have the benefit of the, the proverbial water cooler conversation, right? So you need to be able to build, to build that, that, that personal rapport, but also be efficient and, and effective with your time. And, uh, and it's great, obviously, now that we're all, you know, we're all traveling again and, um, you know, have the opportunities to, to spend time um, with each other. Absolutely. Well, Richard, it was a pleasure to have you on. I appreciate you taking the time to be on the One Soccer Nation podcast. Oh, it's been been an absolute pleasure, Kareem. Thank you so much again for, for the invitation. And um, yeah, thanks again. Yeah.